Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on Motion 4799 in the name of Lorna Slater on Scotland's National Parks. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Lorna Slater, Minister, to speak to and to move the motion up to 13 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland is a rich, diverse and beautiful country. From the rolling hills and the borders to the rugged mountains and sinuous sea lochs of the west, the crofting landscapes and towering sea cliffs teeming with noisy seabirds on our many islands, the vast patterned peatlands of the flow country, the vibrant agricultural landscapes of lowland Scotland. Throughout the country, over millennia, the people of Scotland have worked with and shaped their natural surroundings, and in doing so have shaped their distinctive cultural heritage. A heritage that is famous around the world, that draws millions of visitors every year. I therefore find it astonishing that we have just two national parks, and I know this is a view shared by many here. Our national parks are part of a global national park movement, valuing and protecting nature around the world. This brings opportunities to showcase globally what Scotland is doing for nature restoration, addressing climate change, visitor management, and a range of other issues. It also gives us the opportunity to learn what approaches are being taken elsewhere and adapt and improve them for our own Scottish needs. Our parks are more important now than ever before. We are in the midst of the interlinked crises of climate change and biodiversity loss, which require urgent action to keep our planet habitable, to keep our crops growing, our climate bearable, our ecosystems alive. We know that some of the effects of global heating are now locked in, such as temperature rise and increase in extreme weather events, no matter how quickly net zero is achieved. So people and nature are going to need to adapt to the changing environment. The window to act is closing. This is the decade when we must redefine our relationship with nature or the degradation of our natural environment and climate breakdown will have gone past the point where they can be managed. By working with and restoring nature at scale, the events, so the effects of climate change can be reduced and wider benefits to individuals, communities and the country can be realized as carbon is captured and stored from the atmosphere plants, animals, and other species flourish as humans live and work alongside a thriving natural environment. There are three elements that I would now like to bring to the attention of Parliament. Firstly, the work of the two existing parks in tackling the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. Secondly, the work of the parks in welcoming and managing visitors. And thirdly, to highlight the national conversation, which is currently underway to capture what stakeholders most value about national parks and how this will inform the identification of the areas to be taken forward for designation as Scotland's next national parks. Certainly. I thank the Minister for giving way. Would the Minister not uh, consider that there should be a fourth consideration added to the three that she's mentioned, namely the fourth aim of the national parks in Scotland? which are the social and economic development of the area's uh, communities, uh, which is extremely important to people who live, uh, as I represent, in the National Park in Cairngorm. Minister. I thank the member very much for that intervention. He's quite right that the aims of our parks were established in the National Parks Scotland Act of 2000. And as a reminder to all of us, the four aims are to conserve and enhance natural and cultural heritage, to promote sustainable use of resources, to promote understanding and enjoyment, and as the member rightly points out, to promote sustainable economic and social development. This means that our existing national parks in Loch Lomond and the Trossachs and the Cairngorms are at the forefront of actions to tackle climate change and nature restoration, and also welcoming, educating, and managing millions of visitors each year. Loch Lomond and Trossachs and Cairngorms Park Authorities devote significant resources to lead and work with partners and their communities on nature restoration and climate mitigation within their park areas. As we know, halting and reversing biodiversity loss through restoring nature and addressing climate change are inextricably linked. 
Both park authorities set out their ambitious plans for the natural environment in their areas through the future network, sorry, the future nature proposals in Loch Lomond and the nature plan in the Cairngorms. Both recognise that we can no longer be passive in protecting the biodiversity we have, but need to be proactive and vigorously rebuilding and restoring nature. To do this, both parks are working with partners to address head-on the pressures such as overgrazing, pollution, invasive non-native species, and climate change. To restore degraded areas and better link areas, to give nature the space to adapt to our rapidly changing environment. There can be no better places to see the aspiration becoming a reality than with the Cairngorms Connect partnership with its 200-year vision to restore ecosystem functioning and biodiversity over huge areas of the eastern part of the National Park, or the work to secure and restore the Great Trossachs Forest over 160 square kilometres within the heart of Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. Running through many of the projects which the parks are leading is active community involvement to identify and prioritise areas for action and to mobilise the volunteer workforce who carry out much of the ground action, um, such as removal of invasive non-native plants. Please go ahead. Finley Carson. I appreciate the Minister taking intervention. We know that national parks must have a coherent, coherent identity as well as being of outstanding uh, quality in terms of natural and cultural heritage. But they mustn't simply become playgrounds or museums for visitors. So how will you ensure that social and economic needs of the host communities will be met, particularly given the importance right now of food security? Minister. I thank the member very much for the intervention. And of course, the member is correct. Our parks are living, breathing, dynamic spaces with communities in them who live and work there, including our agricultural communities. As I progress through uh, my speech, we will talk about the process for creating the new national parks and how we can make sure that stakeholder views are incorporated. A striking example of initiatives we have in our parks and how these initiatives can draw in additional funding is the £12.5 million which was recently secured from the National Lottery Heritage Fund for the Heritage Horizons Cairngorms 2030 People and Nature Thriving Together project. The work of chasing down and securing additional funding for nature restoration does not stop with individual landscape scale projects. Both of our parks are in partnership with the other national parks in the UK to develop a private finance mechanism to bring in investment for nature restoration. Through the Wild Strathfillan project, the Loch Lomond Authority are piloting approaches to levering significant private investment to improve ecosystem services and restore nature. Our two parks host internationally important habitats, such as Atlantic rainforest and high altitude moorland, and grassland and the plants and animals which rely on them, including unique species such as the Scottish crossbill, a distinct subspecies of the common crossbill. Sadly, one of our iconic species of the Caledonian pine woods, the Capricale, has over recent decades seen sharp declines in its population due to pressures of climate change and disturbance. However, the Capricale project has recently secured £2.9 million to allow local communities to deliver habitat management and improve visitor management to reduce the disturbance for these magnificent birds. Certainly. I'm most grateful for the Minister's indulgence. Does the Minister recognise that one of the reasons for the, the decline of the Capra uh, and the lack of, of, of uh, new members of the species is the lack of predator control? in particular of foxes, and that Nature Scott now recognise that that was a mistake and are seeking to correct it. And does the Minister support that? Minister. I thank the member very much for the intervention. This is, I discussed this uh, at a meeting with the park uh, authorities last week, and they are looking at a broad range of measures for uh, improving Capricale numbers, and that includes visitor, um, ma visitor management to reduce disturbance and also looking at predator control. Uh, this brings me to the crucial role which both parks play. Sorry, uh, yes. This brings me to the crucial role which both parks play in welcoming visitors, informing them of key messages around the climate and biodiversity twin crises, and managing some of the negative effects of high numbers of people, particularly at popular sites. As we have emerged from the pandemic lockdowns with travel abroad severely constrained, the people of Scotland have looked to the countryside on their doorstep for recreation. 
Both parks now have excellent ranger services to ensure a positive and safe experience for visitors, residents and nature in our national parks. Presented with all this evidence of the importance of the work that parks do, how popular they are to the millions who visit them and how enthusiastically various regions of Scotland are already campaigning to host, there is undoubtedly a compelling case to expand Scotland's national park network. I am delighted that there have been several areas who have put themselves forward as candidates for national park status, some with long established campaign groups, and, hope to, and I hope to see more join the discussion over the coming months. Well, Certainly. Martin Whitfield. Was the Minister giving way? Can she give an explanation as why it's taken so long to be looking at a third, possibly hopefully a fourth, fifth, and sixth national park here in Scotland? Minister. Absolutely. I thank the member for the question. Um, I will cover the time scale in the course of my speech, so I will continue so we get to the point where I can answer the member. This process of creating a new national park gives, or at least one new national park, gives us the opportunity to have a national discussion, not just about where new parks should be, but also about what our national parks are for. Beyond the aims set out in the National Park Scotland Act of 2000, there has been no criteria set for what national parks should be delivering for Scotland, their communities, as some members pointed out, or nature. On the 13th of May, I launched a national discussion, which will carry over into the summer months about what stakeholders and the public value most about national parks and how this should be delivered. The results of this national discussion on the future for national parks will do two things. Firstly, it will help existing park authorities to evaluate and adapt what they are delivering across their remit through their partnership plans. Secondly, it will allow the development of an evaluation framework to identify the next areas to take forward to designation. This is essential as it allows for an open, fair and transparent process. This will include a consultation on the draft evaluation framework to ensure that it meets the needs so it meets the aspirations of stakeholders for the new national parks and ensure that there is no unintentional bias which may favour one area over another. Officials are also wor working to put in place support for communities, local authorities or interest groups in putting together a nomination for national park status against the criteria established in that evaluation framework. Furthermore, although it will be my responsibility to approve the areas to be taken forward to the statutory process outlined in the Act, the decision I take will be guided by advice I receive from an independent panel, which will be established to consider all nominations and rank them against the criteria contained in the evaluation framework. As you will appreciate, identifying the areas to be designated national parks is only half the story, as then the legal process laid out in the Act to define the boundary of the new parks and establish the new authority must be followed. So that process follows a specific timeline. Yes, please go ahead. Finn Carson. Just on a technicality, can, can you set out what exactly the process will be if you have multiple bids from multiple different organisations or individuals within one potential area to be designated? How will you deal with that? Uh, Minister. The specifics of the evaluation criteria have not yet been established, so we're going to be looking at the process as we go forward. The member raises an excellent point, and of course, it is something we will absolutely need to be able to accommodate so that we have coherent applications into the process that can be evaluated fairly. Just continuing on to the point about the process for creating the parks, once we've followed the legal process to be laid out in the Act, this will further entail scrutiny of the areas against the aims and conditions specified by that Act and further consultation, led by Nature Scott in their role as rapporteur. There is then the progression of the designation order through Parliament to further evaluate and shape the proposal, including further opportunity for stakeholder input. So the member can see that there are many steps we have to go through to follow the correct legal process. Lastly, I am very much looking forward to the debate today to hear members' views on what they think the role of our national parks, established and new, should play in their local areas and nationally for the benefit of nature, the people of Scotland and visitors to our beautiful country. I welcome the constructive approach that has been taken by my Labour colleagues and the support that they have shown for our proposal to create new national parks in Scotland, and I'm happy to support the amendment in Colin Smith's name. I also welcome that my Conservative colleagues recognise the important role our national parks play for the environment and the economic benefits that they can bring to local communities. 
However, they need to acknowledge that such an important process requires fulsome consultation. In addition, there is a clear legislative process that needs to be followed as set out in the founding legislation. Minister, and could I ask you to bring your remarks to close, please? Certainly. Therefore, I cannot accept calls to shortcut the process or shorten it at the expense of public engagement. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Brian Buiso to speak to and to move Amendment 4799.1. Up to nine minutes, please, Mr Buiso. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward uh, such an important debate. I think we are broadly ag agree with the sentiments expressed in their motion, but we do feel somewhat of a broad brush. Our amendment seeks to develop the point somewhat, while also noting that there is a clear desire from those behind the campaigns for new national parks and the public more widely to move faster on designating Scotland's next national park. We note the motion makes a number of references to the evaluation process and stakeholder engagement. But there is a clear sense from across Scotland that the Scottish Government have been dragging their feet on this issue. Similarly, we are of the view that, uh, that the value and importance of Scottish Scotland's rural landscape and communities deserve greater recognition than they receive. While well, designation of one or hopefully more national parks could go some way to addressing this, we feel it won't go far enough in terms of recognising the many areas across Scotland which, perhaps not suited to be a national park, deserve greater access to support and opportunities to preserve and capitalise on their natural assets. We will be supporting uh, Labour's amendment proposed by Colin Smith. Uh, it is clear there is a broad agreement across the Chamber about the value of national parks and the potential to make a substantial contribution not only to the local area, but also to the wider twin challenges of climate change and biodiversity. And it is biodiversity where I really want to begin uh, this debate, not least because it is often overshadowed uh, in discussions by, in, by climate change, but of course is no less important. And there has been little change to the decline of biodiversity in the last 10 years under the current government. The 2019 State of Nature Scotland report found that the overall abundance and distribution of Scotland's species have declined, including in the last 10 years, and the pressures that drive biodiversity loss are collectively continuing to have a negative impact on nature. The report says, and I quote, there has been no let-up in the net loss of nature in Scotland. And it should come as no surprise that in 2021, RSPB and the Natural History Museum found that Scotland is in the bottom 25 per cent of nations and territories for biodiversity intactness, ranking in the lowest of the G7 countries. We require an integrated land management which can be used by park authorities, encouraging a cooperative framework between sectors and breaking down silos. Farming and forestry can be viewed as sectors to narrow biodiversity. However, with proper support, these sectors can deliver on their biodiversity targets as well as their commodity markets. In her priority of government, st government statement, the First Minister announced the aim to protect and enhance our natural habitats by increasing woodland creation by 50 per cent. However, planting non-native sitka is not increasing woodland, nor is it addressing biodiversity. Having a more robust forestry plan with the diversity of native trees has been shown to store more carbon emissions than Sitka alone and lead to a more resilient ecosystem. Of course. I, mean, I understand there is the target for a native species of about 40 per cent of new trees planted, but does the member not recognise that Sitka spruce has excellent qualities as this essential raw material for our panel product sector and our timber sector, which have operations within our national parks. Brian Wiseau. Can I thank the member for intervention? Of course, he's, he is absolutely right, but I think there has been such a, a, a predominance of, of Sitka over the, uh, the past few while that it, it is recognised that uh, uh, an overplanting of Sitka does decrease our biodiversity in, 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 those, in those particular areas. I think having a more robust forestry plan with the diversity of native trees has been shown to store more carbon emissions than Sitka alone and lead to a more resilient ecosystem, as I said. And as I wanted to use the example of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, the Water Vole project. Removal of, of self-seeded Sidka spruce trees allowed grass and other native wetland vegetation to return, as well as increasing the diversity of native plants for water voles. A healthy wetland ecosystem will absorb more carbon and retain more water, helping to prevent flooding downstream. Marine diversity, I think, is another area that is often overlooked. For example, 12 breeding seabird species have declined in abundance by an average 
of 38 per cent between 1986 and 2016. The plankton communities have changed in response to climate change, which of course impacts fishing birds higher up the food chain. So that management of marine environments by Marine Scotland is often indiscriminately, which does not allow for targeted and effective manage, management of our blue resource. I think siloed management of our environments on a whole drastically reduces our management effectiveness. So organisations from NGOs to fisheries unions are calling for more integrated management on land and in sea. There is a lack of data from Marine Scotland to allow them to make better management decisions. However, third-party groups have done considerable research that is publicly available for them to adopt and use. Use of national marine parks can help establish Scotland's blue economy and blue carbon, much like it has aided Scotland's rural economy and peatland carbon sequestration. Using the national parks to do so would help with sustainable, sustainably developing this economy with increased collaboration with local stakeholders through the park authorities. We can, we can put management of these areas back into local hands with traditional knowledge. Farmers and landowners play an important role in this. Conservation efforts need to be based on cooperation and collaboration, not unilaterally imposing restrictions. National parks represent an opportunity for farmers to diversify their businesses, making the most of opportunities around tourism and direct-to-market sale of local produce. Indeed, a number of farmers in the proposed Galloway National Park are very supportive of this proposal. A national park should empower farmers, giving them more opportunities to farm sustainably and earn a better living and be even more effective custodians of the countryside. Members will know, uh, of course, that it is rare uh, in a speech by me in this chamber that does not manage to include a reference to health, and they would be delighted to know this one is no exception. I think the motion acknowledges the uh, cultural, social and ec ec economic benefits of National Park, but equally it is important to recognise the substantial contribution that National Parks and Scotland's rural areas more widely can make to public health. Without wishing to be accused of bias, of course, there are few places in the world better suited to walking and cycling than the Scottish countryside. I think the benefits of physical activity of any kind, from walking to mountain biking, are well recognised. That regular physical activity can help prevent illness, aid recovery and improve mental health. National parks in Scotland's countryside more widely are an incredible, in my view, undervalued asset in the fight to improve uh, uh, public health. And we're already seeing many communities in rural areas recognising this and taking action. Any action we can take here which encourages people to make the most of what our countryside has to offer is inevitably going to make a difference to public health. And at a time when our NHS is under pressure, like never before, it must surely be incumbent on us to promote steps people can take to prevent illness and encourage a healthier lifestyle. There is no question, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that Scotland needs more national parks. We in these benches are clear that the Galloway's proposal is one we support. I am sure my colleague Finn, Park, uh, Finn Carson will no doubt expand on this. But a successful bid from them should not be the end of the discussion about national parks for another two decades. Uh, the Scottish Government can't go two days without demands for new powers, but they have managed 20 years without really using the powers they have to designate national parks. As our motion uh, sets out, we want the definition of what con uh, constitutes a national park to be as wide as possible. We should be thinking about what other options might be available to give our rural communities perhaps smaller areas in national parks which provide these opportunities and tools necessary to protect their local environment and capitalise on local assets. Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Mr Whittle, did you move the amendment? I do, I do apologise, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I call the next speaker, can I just remind everybody who is seeking to speak in the debate to make sure that the request to speak buttons are pressed and continue to be pressed, not looking at anybody in particular. And I now call Colin Smith to speak to and move amendment 4799.2. Up to seven minutes, please. President Officer, more than two years ago, Parliament unanimously agreed to support an amendment I tabled, not only recognising the contribution that our current national parks make, but agreeing that new national parks should be designated in Scotland. Slowly but surely, we edge towards the will of Parliament, and it can't come quick enough. It's more than two decades since my, my colleague Sarah Boyack, I have to say, hasn't changed a bit, took the National Parks Scotland Act 2000 through Parliament. That groundbreaking legislation paved the way for the then Labour-led Scottish Executive to create Loch Lomond in the Trossachs National Park, which my colleague Jackie Bailey, who also hasn't changed a bit, I have to say, will have much to say about 
in her contribution. It also led to the Cairngorms National Park in 2003. Labour are proud of that achievement and the real social, economic and environmental benefits those parks have delivered for those areas. But, President Officer, it is very much unfinished business. When those parks were created, no one anticipated the SNP would fail to continue the work my colleagues began in creating national parks in Scotland. Despite our outstanding natural beauty, despite the fact that natural national park status is a successful and internationally recognised brand, we still have just two here in Scotland, which the Minister rightly said is astonishing. Compare that with 10 in England and 3 in Wales, or indeed Norway, which has 47. Given our world-class scenery, the protection and management that national parks provide for that scenery, and the benefits to tourism and rural development of the national park brand, the case for expanding the number of parks in Scotland is clear, and it has been for years. That is why Labour's long-standing policy has been to do just that. And, President Officer, it is no secret that I have been very vocal in my view that one of those new parks should be in Galloway, a proposal which has significant public support, including from Dumfries and Galloway Council, as far back as when I chaired the Council's Economy and Environment Committee, as well as from councils in Ayrshire. With an internationally designated UNESCO biosphere, the first dark skies park in Scotland, the stunning Galloway Forest, a rich mosaic of farmland so important to deliver that food security and amazing wildlife, Galloway has been a national park in waiting for years. Indeed, it is five years since the report for the Galloway National Park Association revealed that a new national park could add between 250,000 and 500,000 new visits each year to Galloway and South Ayrshire, worth 30 to 60 million in additional spend, helping create and support between 700 and 1,400 additional jobs to complement existing jobs in crucial sectors such as agriculture. That really could be game-changing in a local economy in one of the most peripheral parts of Scotland whose challenges of low pay and outward migration of young people are very much well documented. That is why, President Officer, if the Government is serious about a more inclusive economy, it is vital that the criteria for new national parks recognises those areas where the potential economic boost will be greatest, for example, areas which do not currently have the highest visitor numbers and are too often forgotten. As well as Galloway, there are other areas which would receive such a, a significant economic boost from national park status, including the Scottish borders. The southern part of the borders, in particular, which is the, the favoured area for a national park from the, the Campaign for a Scottish Borders National Park, is in pressing need of an economic boost. With easy access to both the, the Central Belt and North of England, a borders national park would help deliver that boost, bringing more visitors to the area. The community campaigns in both Galloway and the borders and elsewhere show there is real demand, a real appetite to grow the number of national parks in Scotland. That is why Labour believes the Scottish Government's ambitions should not be limited to just one new national park in this Parliament. And indeed, I remind the Minister of her own party's manifesto, which commits the Scottish Greens to at least two new national parks and one new regional park. So I wonder if, in closing, the Minister will say whether the spending plans published last week provide sufficient resources to deliver more than one new national park in this Parliament. Now, given how far Scotland has fallen behind, there would be no reason to stop the Scottish Government favouring, for example, two parks in southern Scotland, potentially reducing costs by sharing services and building on the close growing links between the borders and Dumfries and Galloway, ensuring that every borderlands rural local authority had a national park in its area. Paving the way for a new area of national parks would not only boost the economic recovery for many areas, but it would contribute to Scotland's climate and biodiversity recovery. It is two years since the Scottish Government gave a commitment to increase our protected areas for nature to at least 30 per cent of Scotland's terrestrial area by 2030, in line with the International Campaign for Nature. However, with the clock ticking, we currently sit at less than a quarter. Across the UK, that target is being met by designating new national parks. Scotland is in danger of falling further behind. Now, I know that some people may understandably ask, at a time of public spending pressures, can we afford to spend money on new national parks? But given that national parks bring in between £10 and £17 pounds investment to an area for every pound that is spent, the question really is, can we afford not to if we want to deliver that economic and environmental recovery that we need, in particular in communities that for far too long have been left behind? If I have got time... If, yeah. Yeah. A brief intervention, Mr Yee. 
Yes, there, there are benefits of, uh, from being within a national park, but does he also recognise that many people who live in Cairngorm National Park feel that over the past uh, nearly two decades there has been a lack of sufficient per permits of new housing, affordable and mid-rent housing, which is acting as a big constraint uh, on the sustainable growth of the economy? Colin Smith. There is absolutely no doubt that the, 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 the member raises an important point about the lack of housing in many of our rural communities. That is why I have constantly urged the government to, to, to look again at its current target of about 10 per cent of new housing being for rural areas. If we are going to regenerate our rural communities, we need to raise our ambition when it comes to developing uh, new housing in those areas. So, President Officer, in concluding, I want to pay tribute to the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland and the Scottish Campaign for National Parks, who have led the 12-year-long campaign for more national parks, as well as the community-led campaigns by the, the Galloway National Park Association and the Campaign for a Scottish Borders National Park, and also elsewhere. I have to say, time after time, I have taken part in debates in this chamber when SNP ministers have said no to new national parks, but those groups refuse to take no for an answer. They redoubled their efforts. They kept fighting. And the only reason that we are in a position where any new national parks could be created in the next few years is the perseverance of those groups, including community-led proposals for Galloway and the Borders National Parks. President officer, new national parks are not a panacea, but they offer a rare chance to make a difference and at long last build on the achievements of the previous Labour-led government. I am therefore pleased to move the amendment in my name, and I hope that Parliament will unite today by committing to complete and unfinished business, which is Scotland's national parks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I now call in Beatrice Wishart, who is joining us remotely. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And firstly, I'd like to convey my apologies because I must leave the debate early, and I have permission from the Presiding Officer to do so. And it's in order to make my travel commitments later this afternoon. Scottish Liberal Democrats will support new national parks and the motion today. During the pandemic and as restrictions in local areas lifted, I saw for myself how people, often having lived in Shetland all their lives, discovered parts of our islands that they'd never ventured to before, finding the spectacular sights and the natural world around us and the improvement it made on their well-being during that tough time. Today, I'll begin with a few words about the next generation and the climate, and then speak about the benefits of new national parks and about including communities in the decision-making process for new national parks. Our party has long believed that the stewardship of our planet should be taken more seriously and considered more closely. I believe there's great hope of this as we look to the next generation, and we've much to learn from young climate activists such as Greta Thunberg. Young people have had an incredible impact on the conversation around the climate emergency so far. The school strikes in 2019 made a huge difference, and we saw young people marching down the Royal Mile and knocking on Parliament's door. Governments around the world, including in Scotland, were forced to declare a climate emergency. It had a real impact on decision makers in the Scottish Parliament, and it helped Scottish Liberal Democrats win the argument for stronger targets for 2030 during the course of the Climate Change Act. With support from others, we amended the law. Creating new national parks is an effective shorter-term action that we can take to help tackle the climate and biodiversity crises. For these reasons alone should be sufficient to create new national parks that are greater benefits, as others have already mentioned this afternoon. In 1982, the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries created a term which translates to forest bathing or absorbing, absorbing the forest atmosphere, encouraging people to spend time in nature. We know that outdoor spaces help mental and physical health and well-being, creating new national parks has the potential to encourage new visitors to enjoy an area that they may never have considered before. Rural employment can also be boosted as new jobs Sorry, as new jobs are created to help further maintain the land, but we should also consider the local infrastructure. If we anticipate that more tourists will visit, we have to consider upgrades to local roads, trails, plans for conservation of land, and all that could be damaged by tourism. And we must work together to ensure communities get the most out of new national parks. Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome the start of stakeholder engagement for new national parks 
and no two places in nature are identical, and each community has something unique to protect and promote in its green local spaces. We must be sensitive to this and listen to the voices of those who live in and near any proposed new national park. They would be the first to be impacted by any issue. They know their areas best and they stand to benefit the most from a new national park. We should also be mindful of what we could be asking of residents by embracing greater tourism. There can be tension between residents and tourism and we need to be mindful of this from the start of the process and work out solutions that require listening to local voices concerns and engaging in meaningful consultations. To conclude, the Scottish Liberal Democrat 2021 manifesto committed us to supporting the development of a new national strategy to designate more national parks as part of a wider network of protected landscapes. We are willing to work with others to help establish such a network. Our manifesto also committed to developing the position of outdoor recreation champion within government to help everyone in Scotland maximise the benefit from new national parks. We recognise the important role local communities and stakeholders will play during consultations about new national parks and encourage them to voice their opinions. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, uh, Ms Bishop. And we will now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches up to six minutes. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Donald Cameron. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate about the creation of at least one new national park here in Scotland. I want to focus my contribution particularly on the campaign for a national park in Dumfries and Galloway and on the governance and structure on any proposed national park. And thirdly, the, on the exciting opportunity we have to create the right national park model. Presiding officer, currently there is limited stat statutory criteria on the face of the National Park Scotland Act for national park selection. And I note the launch of the consultation to gain ideas on what Scotland's new national park could, could encompass. There have been 102 ideas submitted so far, and I would encourage members to take a look. Some of the responses and comments are very, very interesting. In the designation of a new national park, there is an opportunity to look at what has worked well with our current two national parks, as well as the lessons which could be learned to design a better governance and regulatory system for a new national park in Scotland. Turning to Galloway, a new national park could provide an opportunity to promote and conserve some of Scotland's most magnificent landscapes, which we are fortunate to have across our bonnie Galloway. It, it could attract visitors and allow our fragile rural economy in the south west of Scotland to rebuild from the pandemic and thrive for the future, while helping Scotland tackle both the biodiversity and climate emergency challenges. But I have been constant, consistently clear about this, and any new national park cannot be a national park just for national park's sake. It must be done in cooperation with the communities it intends to serve, and it must not create further bureaucratic or restrictive approach to issues such as planning, new development and many new ideas that will support addressing biodiversity and climate issues. Presiding officer, the Galloway National Park Association has had conversations with almost 2,000 people at over 100 meetings and events across Galloway, and these conversations, along with the consultative work, have interest in findings. Galloway needs to be on par with the rest of Scotland in economic terms, and many res respondents to the GNPA engagement felt that a national park did have the potential to bring economic benefit to the region through increased tourism, definitely, jo job creation and international recognition. Respondents felt that Galloway's dispersed rural population presents additional challenges, but being a recognised national park was seen by some, including hotel, B&B accommodation, outdoor activity providers, as a potential catalyst for business development and expansion. Some also felt a national park may be vital in providing opportunities for our region's young people to consider taking up employment opportunities on their doorstep. And Colin Smith has mentioned this already. Instead of our young folk leaving the region to pursue employment, as many currently do, 
However, presiding officer, there are already fantastic resources available across Galloway, and Colin Smith has said about these already, and it is worth reiterating, though. We have the UNESCO Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere, Seven Stains Mountain Biking, Water Sports at the Galloway Activity Centre at Loch Ken, the Galloway Forest Park and the Dark Sky Park, and many distilleries, breweries, museums and artistic venues. These allow people to explore the outdoors and in the biosphere, where I'm hosting a reception here in Parliament in September, hopefully, it's been backed up by 1.9 million of Scottish Government funding. It's already enhancing our natural environment, educating people on nature and on the climate emergency. I have had direct feedback that these resources need to be built upon and expanded and funded for the future. I have been engaging, presiding officer, with constituents and the National Farmers Union locally and nationally, who are not necessarily in favour of the proposal for a national park in Galloway or the borders. One of the key reasons for this is that many are concerned that national park status in the area may create barriers to development in terms of planning and regenerative farming, and that it may present barriers to agricultural diversification or develop new income streams. Through my engagement with the GNPA, I have expressed my concern over the potential bureaucracy that a national park could create when it comes to planning issues, board members' monetary compensation and local democracy and decision-making. For example, aware, I am aware there has been significant conflict in national parks where planning decisions are subject to the National Park Board and not the local authority. I also know the challenges experienced by renewable energy investors when aiming to bring development to national park areas, investment which could bring much needed community benefit. I therefore ask the Minister, as some of the responses to the consultation, I, I, I will take an intervention uh, if it's quick. Thanks. Briefly, Mr Carson. Uh, the, the member touched on uh, renewables. Are there too many wind farms in Dumfries and Galloway? Emma Harper. Well, <laughs> it's a, thank you for that intervention. I really do. I think I know you've raised this before in chamber, eh, Mr. Carson. But I think this is one of the issues that there are concerns about. We're planning at the moment remains with the local authority, and that means that the community are consulted and widely consulted in order to make these decisions as we go forward. So, eh, my question for the minister is that some of the responses to the consultation eh, have. Eh, are asking that the Scottish Government re remains open-minded about changing the structure of any proposed national park, and it will need to focus on protecting and enhancing the natural environment while tackling the twin crisis of the climate emergency, but not determining planning applications or becoming restrictive to local development. In closing, of course I agree national parks can bring huge benefit, and wherever a national park is created, it must have the right model, it must involve the local community, and it must gain the support of the local community, wherever it is chosen to be delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Harper. I now call Donald Cameron to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I refer to my register of interest in terms of uh, farming, crofting and land management? Um, I greatly welcome the opportunity to de debate this issue, given the importance of our existing national parks and the pressing need to add to them. As other members have noted, there are some 3,500 national parks worldwide, but we only have two here in Scotland and 15 across the whole of the United Kingdom. Given that the UN has set a target that 30% of the planet's surface must be protected by 2030, there is clearly an imperative for us to do more to help realise this global ambition. As such, we welcome this step by the Scottish Government in terms of their broad policy to create new national parks in Scotland, though it's regrettable that the SNP needed to be pushed into this position by the Scottish Greens. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I am lucky enough to have one of Scotland's national parks in part of my region. Ken Gorm stretches from the centre of the Highlands and Islands into Aberdeenshire, Murray and Perthshire, and indeed is the largest park in the UK. In fact, it is larger than the whole of Luxembourg, to give members some context. It's home to nine natural nature reserves, six locks and three rivers. And not only does it boast an array of spectacular nature, but it's economically beneficial to the communities within and around it. And Fergus Ewing was quite right, in my view, to stress this, as well as issues of, of housing. National parks do not exist in isolation from resident communities, and their needs, their lives, their livelihoods must be recognised too. Cairngorm attracts 
1.92 million visitors each year, and it employs around 8,100 people as of a few years ago, 60% of those roles being full-time. Like many parks, it was heavily impacted during COVID, with its economic value falling by 14.8% compared to Scotland as a whole, which fell 9.4%. It's a reminder of the fragility of rural Scotland, particularly when faced with major economic shocks. But with that said, Cairngorm's status as a national park has helped to preserve and grow its wide abundance of flora and fauna. According to the, the Cairngorm, 70% of its rivers are considered to be in good ecological status, and it has nationally important populations of salmon and three species of lampreys, as well as the globally endangered freshwater pearl mussel. Around 79% of Cairngorm's woodlands are comprised of native tree species, and two of the park's major wetlands are globally recognised Ramsar sites. Given the clear benefits that Cairngorm gets from having national park status, it seems right that this should be applied elsewhere. And the Scottish campaign for national parks mentions some other potential areas in the Highlands and Islands. Glen Affric, Ben Nevis, Glencoe and Blackmount, Wester Ross, Harris, and of course the coastal and marine uh, potential on the western seaboard of Argyll. As Brian Whittle has noted, the Scottish Conservatives support establishing a national park in Galloway. And we note that this has the support of local communities, businesses and farmers in the area. And having seen the immeasurable social and economic benefits Ken Gorm has brought the Highlands and Islands, surely it's high time to develop that model in places uh, like Galloway, of course. Emma Harper. I thank Donald Cameron for taking an intervention. He says that farmers are welcoming a national park. We do not agree, though, that there is a bit of a back and forward with some members of the National Farmers Union. Interviews in Galloway are a wee bit sceptical until they get more information. Donald Cameron. Well, I'm not aware of the precise uh, uh, discourse in, in the farming community in um, Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm sure Finlay Carson uh, will go into that in much more thorough detail than I ever could. But the point I would like to make is that there is a tension, and I accept that, there is a tension between uh, potential uh, um, expansion of national parks and um, trying to, to also take into account existing interests such as farming uh, and crofting. Can I take this opportunity to praise Finlay Carson in particular as the local MSP for Galloway for his passion in pushing the national park there? Ever since we were elected in 2016, he's been relentless in his advocacy of a national park in Galloway, and I pay tribute to his hard work and dogged persistence on this important issue, so critical for his local constituents. What is clear, though, is the fact that this uh, could have happened some time ago, and the lack of enthusiasm from the Scottish Government to create more national parks does seem to have hampered Galloway's case, and indeed the case for other areas to receive such status. We know that the former Environment Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, said in 2016, the creation of new national parks requires considerable planning, and it carries cost, application, cost implications. However, as the facts show with Ken Gorm, the economic and ecological advantages certainly seem to outweigh the constraints. And with that said, it's right that local communities, businesses and land managers are fully consulted when considering such plans. As BSC Scotland says, and rightly so, the uniqueness of national parks is the result of generations of communities managing the land. And if government wants to future-proof these landscapes, then local communities and rural workers should be central to the government's proposal. And it is also important when considering the designation of new national parks to think about how this will help Scotland meet its environmental targets. We had a statement on emissions just um, before this debate, um, but it is important um, that we, we, uh, we, we know and we recognise that the government does have a poor record in missing its own legal emissions targets for the last three years and failing to slow the decline in biodiversity. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives fully support proposals to create new national parks where they receive the support of local communities, businesses and land managers. As Cairn Gorm has shown, national parks can not only deliver positive environmental outcomes, but also strong economic outcomes too. And while we agree that robust consultation is required, it's clear there is a very strong impetus to do this sooner rather than later, so we can deliver new national parks rather than drag this process out further and unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by paying tribute to Dave Fallows, who sadly passed away recently. Dave had served as a local councillor for 10 years uh, in uh, the Highland Council, uh, and he had many and wide interests as an artist, 
He and his wife, Lena, ran the Newton Moore Arts, Crafts and Gallery uh, for, I think, 17 years. He was an enthusiast for shinty, photography, uh, music, uh, and he took to poetry in his later years. Uh, so I do want to start by paying tribute to, to Dave. He will be sadly missed. He was a man of wide interests and deep thoughts, as the Strasbe and Badenach Herald, known as the Strathy, had to say. Uh, and Dave and I, I think, shared a great love for the Cairngorms, uh, the Cairngorm Mountains, the Massif, and um, I have, presiding officer, as I think you may know, climbed most of the Cairngorms, at least uh, it was a younger, slimmer version that did that many years ago, uh, and now confined to the glens, having come off the bends through necessity, uh, I enjoy the huge array of attractions that the area has to offer. Uh, the Folk Museum in, in Newton Moore, the Highland Wildlife Park, which of course is home to, to pandas, uh, how very popular they are too, um, uh, going through Loch Nanilan, Britain's most popular picnic resort, Rothy Murcus, Ranger Service, Glenmore, the Funicular Railway, the landmark attraction, various distilleries, Cairngorm Brewery. I could go on, uh, perhaps I should finish by mentioning the Cairngorm Hotel, which sadly after the football match that occurred fairly recently where Scotland's exited from the World Cup, every cloud has a silver lining. Aviemore will once again be the unofficial headquarters of the Tartan army. But uh, presenting officer, Dave Fallows um, wrote a letter to me shortly before he died to express his profound concern about the direction of the Cairngorm National Park and to suggest a solution. And his concerns are shared by many in the National Park, not all of whom will necessarily wish to speak out, not least because the park has decision-making powers of planning. Uh, there is widespread concern that there are insufficient homes. There are not enough permissions granted for homes. Those that have been granted take far too long. An excellent development in Boat of Garten, and we live, uh, and we have lived for 15 years in the vicinity of Boat of Garten, took well over a decade to come to fruition. When it did, it should have been far larger, with no detriment to the environment. And in addition to that, those permissions that are granted are often subject to such onerous conditions that it can make the whole exercise unfeasible and add to the cost. Now, many of us believe that the problem is not that there are too many second homes, presiding officer, but there are simply not enough first homes. And this has become an acute concern post-COVID and Brexit. Many businesses, every single successful business that I engage with, and I engage with a lot, uh, do not have enough staff, particularly in hospitality and in the care sector. Uh, and they all say that one reason is that there are simply not the houses for people to live in. And therefore, people may come for a while, but they can't find a house, and therefore, yes, I will, and therefore, they have to leave rather than staying and becoming part of the community. I'll certainly take an intervention. Finley Carson. I appreciate uh, the member taking an intervention. Would it, would it not be better putting the emphasis on the lack of housing in rural areas on failures of this SNP to bring forward appropriate policies, rather than blame it all on national parks? Well, I, I, I don't want to get into the blame game. Uh, I don't think the argument stands up, but I would point out that um, there were two visions for new towns in the Highlands. One is Torna Green that's gone ahead uh, uh, with the blessing of the, of the Scottish Government, uh, and it's an excellent example of uh, a new town that fits well in the landscape, and, and Murray Estates are to be congratulated for that. But the other one was Anne Camus Moor, which was going to be a new town just uh, across the Spey uh, from Aviemore, and has massive local support. And I'm afraid it just did not enjoy uh, the full-throated the full support of the National Park. Indeed, many people thought that they did not want us to succeed at all. That's a real tragedy, I think, from my constituency, and it's a failure. I hope it's one that can, and I certainly think it, could, it should be um, corrected. In addition to that, uh, presiding officer, the Cairngorm National Park has nearly 19,000 of a population. Uh, Yosemite, the, one of the parks, famous parks in the USA, and I visited it, has a population of just over a thousand. 
Yosemite is the fifth larger than the Cairngorms. So our national parks are, are living places where people have got to live and work. And I can tell you, representing the areas I have done for two decades or more, uh, and having lived in the park for the last 15 years approximately, that I'm afraid there is widespread concern. Let me just read a comment from the Grampian Moorland group recently in response to the Cairngorm plans for a massive deer cull. They say, we don't feel the park is working for the people anymore. Now, what do we do about this, presiding officer? Well, Dave Fallows came up with a solution in one of his last, uh, his last communications in his life. And uh, the solution is not to scrap the park, uh, but it is to reform the park, and it's to reform the legislation, uh, and it is to create a directly elected park where 15 of the 19 members should be directly elected by the people. Leonard Cohen said, bring democracy to the USA. Surely it's not that radical, not too radical for the Scottish Government to bring democracy to the Cairngorm National Park. Thank you, Mr Ewing. I now call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I very much welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate, not least because this will be a walk down memory lane, but I also get to be shamelessly parochial. I am extremely proud to represent part of Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. It is undoubtedly a beautiful part of Scotland and, dare I say it, the most stunning scenery in the country as a whole. But now for a little history lesson, because the first ever members' debate in the Parliament was on the creation of a national park at Loch Lomond and the Trossachs, brought forward by my colleague Sylvia Jackson, who represented Stirling constituency um, on the 8th of June 1999. And aside from myself, the only other people um, who are still here that participated in that debate are, of course, Fergus Ewing and Sarah Boyack. Sarah was, of course, the minister that took the legislation through the Parliament, one of the first substantive pieces of legislation passed by the Parliament in July 2000, the National Park Scotland Act, that then led to the creation of Loch Lomond and the Trossachs in 2002 and the Cairngorms in 2003. But it did actually all start many years before that. The Friends of Loch Lomond had campaigned for many years for national parks, assisted by my former colleague, John McFall, now Lord Speaker in the House of Lords. Their persistence and their determination led to a commitment in the manifesto of the 1997 Labour government to create national parks in Scotland, then realised by Labour in the Scottish Parliament. And the framework established all those years ago was clearly sound, as the two national parks have flourished since. They have managed, in my view, to balance protection and conservation of what are significant national assets, safeguarding our natural heritage for future generations, alongside sustainable economic development. And many businesses have thrived in the National Park. Cruise Loch Lomond, Sweeney's Cruises, Loch Lomond Seaplanes, the Duck Bay Hotel, Lodge on Loch Lomond, and many more tourism businesses aside. And let me just acknowledge the contribution of Fergus Ewing when he was a Cabinet Secretary to helping those businesses through the pandemic. They welcome four million visitors every year, and that helps the local economy, but it's fair to say that it's been a challenge too. On sunny days, some, and we have them in Scotland, some communities in Loch Lomond have been overwhelmed by a combination of day trippers, visitors from across the UK and overseas visitors too. Everything from litter, antisocial behaviour, wild camping and cars gridlocking narrow streets have challenged the park to constantly improve its visitor management. Working with the likes of Friends of Loch Lomond and Argyll and Butte Council, there are now improved litter facilities, additional wardens and toilets provided where once there were none. And bylaws, of course, were put in place in 2007, reviewed in 2012 and added to over the years, covering everything from wild camping to speed limits on the loch and the registration of power craft. A further review is coming up this year. Um, and in that context, with the minister sitting there, um, I want to talk about jet skis. Jet ski registrations on Loch Lomond have increased. And whilst this has been a gradual increase year on year since Lake Windermere banned jet skis in 2005, 
it has risen exponentially during the last two years of the pandemic. Lots of people have holidayed at home. We've all had staycations, but some of them have bought jet skis with them. Many of the jet skis on Loch Lomond are not registered. They're launching at different points in the loch, and the behaviour of some users is incredibly dangerous. Driving whilst drunk, driving whilst using drugs, buzzing swimmers close to the shoreline and travelling at dangerous speeds is becoming all too common. Enforcement is clearly challenging. And when I asked the Scottish Government how many people had been charged by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service from 1999 to August 2021, the number was precisely three. That's simply not good enough. The debate now is whether to allow jet skis at all or to confine them to parts of the loch. And I have to say, given the problems with enforcement, I am increasingly of the view that they shouldn't be allowed at all. I visited Lake Windermere last year. It was busy, but it was peaceful. That annoying buzz of jet skis was wholly absent. Wild swimmers could proceed in relative safety. In this case, conservation and protection of our natural environment should perhaps be the priority. And I will leave the Minister to reflect on that. But finally, I want to mention a forthcoming planning application lodged by Lumen Banks, otherwise known as Flamingo Land. Within, it, it was withdrawn three years ago because the National Park re recommended rejection. It is now back with some changes. It no longer destroys all of the ancient woodland, which is welcome. Buildings have been reduced in height, but the density of holiday accommodation remains largely the same. There are issues about traffic and infrastructure, and it is true to say that the community is divided. One of the key considerations for local people is whether the benefit from jobs will outweigh the potential disadvantages. Now, I'm not going to ask the Minister for her opinion. That wouldn't be appropriate. But questions have been raised with me about the Minister's potential involvement. Given that the Minister is responsible for national parks, will she have any influence on the decision, particularly given her Green colleague, Ross Greer, is campaigning against the development? And I think clarity on this would be helpful for my local community to understand. Finally, Presiding Officer, let me say that, like others, I'm disappointed that the SNP have not designated any other national parks in the last 15 years that they've been in charge. But I am delighted that this is now changing and more power to the Minister's elbow in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. I now call on Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Mark Ruskell for around six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I believe that we are truly lucky to live in a country of such breathtaking natural beauty. There is majestic scenery and wild beauty in many a corner of Scotland, yet despite covering nearly a third of the UK's landmass, only two of the 15 national parks are situated here, Loch Lomond in the Trossachs and the Cairngorms. Scotland is more than thrice the size of Wales, and yet the Principality has three national parks compared to our two. I am pleased, therefore, that at its programme for government, the Scottish Government said that it will designate at least one new national park by the end of this Parliament. This will further support progressive development, address the climate emergency and the way we use our land, and improve public and community well-being. There is no doubt the national parks are the globally recognised premier designation for scenery and habitats. Yellowstone, Kruger or Serengeti are only some of the names that spring to mind, each of them attracting hundreds of thousands of visitors each year. Tourism already makes an important contribution to the Scottish economy, and national parks are a brand that attracts visitors and their spending. Having at least one further area, hopefully more, recognised would be a boost to the economy and for the rural and coastal areas that may be included. In 2010, a report commissioned by the Cairngorms National Park Authority, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise, found that in the first seven years following its establishment, Cairngorm National Park enjoyed a 13 per cent increase in the number of businesses operating in the area and a decrease in local unemployment. The study also found that the park had a growing economy worth £398 million a year, with an increasing number of 18 to 25 year olds being attracted to the area. It is not only local tourism that benefited. The food and drink, housing and forest product clusters also saw strong growth post-2003. Beside the economic benefits, national parks also provide positive land and wildlife management. This includes additional resources to safeguard and enhance the special qualities of these areas for the long term, particularly how they can help to promote sustainable land use, protect and restore nature and tackle climate change. 
Scottish National Park Authority is required to pursue the aims set out in the National Parks Act 2000 in a collective and coordinated way, and they have a wider range of powers to achieve this. As mentioned, there are many areas across Scotland of outstanding beauty, and I believe that Clyde Mursey Regional Park, which makes up much of my constituency, should be considered as a new national park. Clyde Mursey is an area of 280 square kilometres, making it Scotland's largest regional park, and it welcomes over 700,000 visitors a year who enjoy walking, running, cycling and other outdoor activities. The wonderful scenery includes the heather hills of Misty Law, Hill of Stake and Brisbane Glen. Stunning views such as Fairley Moor, the sandy beaches of Lunderson Bay, beautiful lochs like Loch Tom or Coburnia Loch. Woodlands, for example Locher Wood and sites of industrial heritage including the now disused Mursiel Barites Mine. Clyde Mursiel also provides important havens for wildlife. Its heather moors are home to one of Britain's rarest birds of prey, the hen harrier. Back in 1947, the Clyde Valley Regional Plan described the Clyde coast from Greenock to West Kilbride thus. This section of the coast, with the hill country behind it, is another area of great popularity, apart from its holiday significance, as a number of glens roaming down to the sea, an area of considerable importance to the rambler and natural historian, and its outlook to the Firth of Clyde and the great blue jagged peaks of Arran is of the highest order of scenic value. Very poetic, I am sure you will agree. However, it was not until December 1990 that Clyde Mursey Regional Park was formally designated covering and protecting land stretching across Renfrewshire, Inverclyde and North Ayrshire. And I thank the friends of Clyde Mercy Regional Park who have worked with local authorities and private landowners to bring areas of disused land in the park back into community use and make it more accessible to the general public. Not only is Clyde Mercy Regional Park a leader in integrated countryside management, the area also frequently demonstrates business excellence through the Green Tourism Business Scheme and Chamber of Commerce Awards. Currently, Scotland's local authorities manage the regional parks with Nature Scotland support and in partnership with the recreation and land management interests. With North Ayrshire, Inverclyde and Renfrew straddling Clyde Mursiel, it encourages these local authorities to work together to manage it and cooperate indeed in other areas. National Park status would not only enhance the public perception of Clyde Mursiel Park, it would also provide the positive management and extra resources required to protect and restore the outstanding biodiversity and landscapes providing long-term opportunities for the public to enjoy and value the area's natural and cultural heritage. Finally, it would also certainly lead to job creation in one of the less prosperous parts of Scotland. Presiding officer, I welcome the Scottish Government's public consultation, which seeks to gather views on the creation of Scotland's first new national parks in almost 20 years. And I believe that Clyde Mealshire Regional Park is a strong contender to be considered for national park status. Anyone who has ever visited its hills, moors and lochs, knows it is an area of outstanding beauty, with good infrastructure, including many visitor centres already in place. Designating Clyde Muir Seal a national park would increase environmental protection and lead to a greater understanding of and boost the relationship with the many adjacent post-industrial communities nearby. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Gibson. I now call on Mark Ruskell, who will be followed by Paul McLennan for around six minutes. Mr Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I think this debate opens the next chapter in the story of Scotland's national parks, a story that started with the spirit of John Muir, saw the cry for countryside access after the war, and then, of course, the birth of the first Scottish parks in the devolution era, and that landmark legislation brought forward by Miss Boyack. Today, given the climate and nature emergencies, there's never been a better time to grow and develop our parks. And I'm delighted that with Greens in government, we're able to play our role in helping to write that next chapter. And as a resident of Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, I know that communities are at the very heart of our parks and listening to those voices will be critical in managing our existing parks better and establishing new ones. And that's why the national conversation announced by the Minister is so important. Now, there is a need for parks to do a lot more, including restoring native woodlands at a vast landscape scale and in tackling many of the housing issues that have been spoken about already. But the national parks agenda must also run alongside a more radical land reform agenda that empowers communities directly. And I look forward to the forthcoming land reform bill and hopefully to Minister McCallan's uh, comments in closing um, about where that might, be, that might be heading. But there are uh, warnings from our National Park story about the need to engage communities meaningfully. Um, for example, the initial sloppy drawing of the Cairngorms National Park boundary was a clear example 
where communities in Highland Persia were ignored. And despite the advice from SNH at the time, uh, the then Scottish Executive in 2003 pushed ahead uh, and excluded Persia from the National Park. The community campaign that followed, led by the irrepressible Bill Wright, culminated in the infamous Twin Peaks launch of the Cairngorms National Park, where on the top of Cairngorms stood Labour Minister Alan Wilson at the official park launch, while on the top of Carnleith stood an unholy alliance of John Swinney, Murdo Fraser, Dennis Canavan, Robin Harper and even myself, declaring the right of Highland Persia to be included in the National Park. And it actually took a member's bill from Mr Swinney with our cross-party backing to finally redraw the park boundary. And I think that's a, a lesson to all ministers from all parties to work closely with communities at the very outset. Now, the pause button on new national parks has been on for uh, two decades now. So it felt like an historic move as part of the Butte House Agreement negotiations last year that I was able to put new national parks back on the table again with my colleagues. And I'm delighted that our new minister, Lorna Slater, is now responsible for their delivery. The community campaigns for new parks have never stopped, and the work of the Scottish Campaign for National Parks has been critical in keeping that flame alive. And their 2013 report into options is a great starting point, although not, not exhaustive. And um, I recently ran a, a very unscientific poll on Twitter to gauge support for their initial seven options. Found that Galloway, uh, Ben Nevis and Glencoe Blackmount and a potential marine and coastal park uh, were very popular. And given the success of the uh, Jurassic Coast National Park in Dorset, uh, I'm really attracted to the idea of a marine and coastal park for Argyll and Mull. But I, I certainly recognise the strong cross-party political support behind Galloway in this chamber. And it does reinforce that national parks are strong economic drivers and that the position of Galloway being easily accessible to Northern England could provide a really strong domestic tourism offering. But I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that national parks are there to conserve and enhance the natural world as much as they are there to enable our enjoyment. The Sanford principle, that where there is unmanageable conflict between public use and conservation, then the environment must come first, is still as important today as it was when national parks were first conceived of in the UK. And that will continue to raise difficult decisions that again need the input of communities to get right. So the introduction of camping management zones, for example, in the Trossachs, sparked strong debate and I think a genuine concern that our fundamental rights to wild camp were being eroded. But in reality, the damage that we saw firsthand to the Loch Sides, for example, at Loch Venica, did need a strong response to stop the destruction. And from what I can see, it has worked without becoming a wider precedent. Ultimately, better facilities for campers will help manage impact. And I certainly urge ministers to look in particular at how a visitor levy could help parks fund facilities that can help people to keep coming back, including you know, better, better toilet facilities, camping areas and extra rangers. Our park authorities, of course, always need to strike a careful balance. And as the Flamingo Land proposal for Loch Lomond rears its head again, decision makers need to go back to that Sanford principle and ask the fundamental question, does it get the conservation balance right? Flamingo, Fl Flamingo Land, in my mind, doesn't and must be thrown out again. But, Presiding Officer, as my former colleague Robin Harper put it in 2020, the setting up of national parks 20 years ago must be the beginning of a process, not an end in itself. We need to see our countryside as a place where biodiversity and the environment are enhanced, our rural communities and their survival are essential to the conservation of wild Scotland. Presiding Officer, that must be the theme of the next chapter in Scotland's national park story. And I look forward very much to seeing new parks in Scotland. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Russell. And I call Paul McLennan to be followed by Dean Lockhart from around six minutes. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I am delighted to be speaking in this debate this afternoon. I am a resident of Dunbar, home to the birthplace of John Muir. John Muir was born in Dunbar on April 21, 1838, and died on Christmas Eve. 1914. John was known as John of the Mountains and father of the national parks. He was a naturalist, an author, an environmentalist, a botanist, a zoologist, and obviously an early advocate for the preservation of the wilderness in the USA. 
His letters, essays and books describe his adventures in nature, especially in the Sierra Nevada, having been read by millions. Dunbar sees many U.S. visitors every single year to visit his birthplace. His activism helped to preserve the Yosemite Valley and Sequoia National Park, and his example has served as an inspiration for the preservation of many other wilderness areas. The Sierra Club, which he co-founded, is a prominent American conservation organisation. As part of the campaign to make Yosemite a national park, John Muir published two landmark articles on wilderness preservation in the Century magazine, The Treasures of Yosemite and the Features of the Proposed Yosemite National Park. This helped support the push for US Congress to pass a bill in 1890 establishing Yosemite National Park. Now, I have had uh, the, the fortune of visiting uh, the park uh, many, many years uh, ago, about 10 years ago. John Muir is an inspiration to both Scots and American, and, and his biographer Stephen Holmes said that Muir had become one of the patron saints of 20th century American environmental activity, both political and recreational. On the 21st of April 2013, the first John Muir Day was celebrated in Scotland, which celebrated the 175th anniversary of his birth. Now, society's underlying health and sustainable environment need to be measured by more than just figures on a balance sheet. I chaired across party group in the wellbeing economy. Since I was elected last May, I have heard many MSPs state we have to move towards a wellbeing economy. But try and ask exactly what that means, and you will get many different answers. I have been working very closely with the Wellbeing Alliance, which urges societies to transform how economies operate. Catherine Trebek of the Wellbeing Alliance warns that unless we rethink who wins and who loses out, we will not have a chance of delivering that goal social justice on a healthy planet. Integrating individual and ecological wellbeing is one of my major ambitions in this term of the Parliament. Of course, we can explore some steps immediately, prioritising green jobs for economic development, protecting biodiversity so that life can thrive, and having a sustainable landscape for everyone to enjoy. Now, as a East Lothian MP, MSP, I will advocate for the Lamy Muirs to join the Trossachs and the Cairngorm to Scotland's third national park, working with agribusiness, rural communities, and environmental and other groups. There is a natural border between the Lothians and the borders. The Lamy Muirs' stunning landscape and history would attract people to the countryside, enhance community wellbeing, and boost the rural economy via ecotourism. Can I also give credit to the APRS and SCNP, having jointly led the campaign for more and better national parks since 2010, supported, of course, by other national organisations. They set out the case for more parks in their 2013 report, Unfinished Business. In 2013, they proposed at least a seven further areas would benefit from being designated as national parks. Of course. National parks constitute the top tier of Scotland's suite of protected landscapes. However, much more work is also required to invigorate national scenic areas and regional parks so that they too can address the climate emergency and nature crisis and accommodate visitors. Perhaps the Minister can say more on our summing up in regards to the plans for these. National parks do a power of work to tackle biodiversity and climate crisis, help manage facilities for visitors, promote responsible access and develop sustainable communities. It is almost 20 years since Scotland's first national parks and Loch Lomond, the Trossachs and Cairngorms were established. The parks, of course, work closely with their communities, land managers, local businesses, third sector and individuals to tackle a biodiversity and climate crisis. And they also help manage facilities for visitors to promote responsible access. The Scottish Government, of course, has already committed to tackling the twin crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change, and has a demonstrably strong track record of making significant funding commitments to protect and restore biodiversity. A commitment to at least £500 million in the natural economy over the course of this a parliament, £250 million for peatland rest restoration over the next 10 years. And in July 2021, the Scottish Nature uh, Government launched the Nature Restoration Fund, which provides £10 million for projects to tackle the causes of biodiversity loss and climate change. Sustainable and, and responsible rural tourism is key in connecting people with nature in urban and rural areas. It brings so many benefits in terms of health and in wellbeing. Working very closely with communities will be key as we develop the new national parks. In their brief in the SCNP and APRS talk about the importance of visitor management. The pandemic has seen the rise of holiday at home and a greater number of people recognising the benefits out into the indoors. In East Lothian and in other areas, there is a challenge to improving access to these busy visitor areas, doing so in a sustainable way that do not erode their value. The SCNP and ARPS discussed potentially a national park service with a broad strategic remit would help improve Scotland's capability for developing and managing its key tourism industry and making the most of its outstanding and environmental assets. President Officer, I opened with a speech talking about John Muir and I am going to close with one of his quotes. Thousands of tired, nerve shaken over-civilised people are beginning to find out what going to the mountains is going home. 
that wilderness is a necessity and that mountain parks and reservations are useful not only for as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr McLean. I now call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Martin Whitfield again for uh, around six minutes. Mr Lockhart. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I'm glad we're having this important debate on national parks, including a discussion of how uh, important they are uh, in bringing social and economic benefits across Scotland. After years of stalling on the issue, it's good to see the Scottish Government finally joining our long-standing position and supporting the creation of at least one new national park. Other members have noted the, the fascinating perspective that there are over 3,500 national parks across the world but only two in Scotland, despite our world's uh, renowned uh, countryside and stunning scenery. That compares to three national parks in Wales, 10 in England and 13 in New Zealand. Now, I think quality is more important than quantity here, but I do think we can and should do more with the designation of national park status. And as our amendment to the motion today highlights, we also want the Scottish Government to explore other avenues to formally recognise and capitalise on Scotland's many outstanding areas of natural capital where national park status itself might not be appropriate. Uh, Presiding officer, representing Mid-Scotland and Fife, I am lucky enough to represent part of the incredible Loch Lomond and Trossex National Park, uh, the virtues of which have already been expounded upon by Jackie Bailey, Bailey in her fascinating history lesson uh, with further historical context provided by Mark Ruskell. And I, I want to focus some of my remarks on some of the constructive lessons that can be gained from the experience of that national park. First of all, community support and consultation is vital to the success of any national park, a point made by many members during the debate. Twenty years ago, when the Loch Lomond and, and uh, Trossachs National Park was created, its creation was not without controv uh, controversy. Um, there were many that lived and worked within its proposed boundary that were extremely concerned uh, about the, what it would mean for their communities uh, for that area becoming a national park. It is therefore very important that uh, the views of all those living and working in areas being considered for a new national park are taken into consideration and that the consultation is a meaningful process. Uh, there should be consultation on how the new, the new national park will be governed, what its remit will be and what powers it will have. This is also an important opportunity to re-evaluate how uh, our existing parks operate and are resourced, so that over time, when we do have newly created national parks, our national parks have the same capacity, the same powers and access to the same resources. Uh, because it is now over 20 years since the original national parks legislation was enabled, a full review of that le legislation, how it has been implemented, would ensure that all of our national parks are properly supported to face the many challenges that lie ahead, uh, not least of which is their role in delivering net zero targets. I, I would therefore welcome um, a commitment from the Minister uh, that the remit, powers and governance for both existing national parks as well as the new national parks will be reviewed and updated as part of this process. Presiding officer, we also need to enable and, and empower national parks to operate as an, uh, autonomous bodies and for them to be able to effectively carry out their responsibilities free from external pressures. As we've heard during the debate, we're looking for national parks to play an important role in tackling biodiversity loss, achieving net zero targets and promoting environmental protection. Critically, this means that national park authorities must have adequate resources to deliver on these outcomes. As an example, the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park is undertaking a series of extensive peatland and woodland restoration projects, uh, very, very uh, exciting projects as part of their net zero delivery plans. And these are the type of projects that will require long-term sustained revenue as well as capital support for many years ahead. And I think I have to say, I have to make the point that years of cuts to local government budgets is making it increasingly difficult and sometimes impossible to finance these projects, something that the Minister has to acknowledge as part of this debate. Uh, presenting off to another challenge that has been mentioned uh, and we have seen in recent years is how national parks can best manage the increasing numbers of visitors during peak season, something we saw coming to light, uh, especially during some of the months of the COVID-19 pandemic. This uh, challenge was highlighted by the Scottish National Parks Strategy Project in its briefing paper when they commented that the effort Scotland has put into marketing its world-class landscapes has not been matched 
by provision for caring for them. I think a, a very good point to make. And this is an area where best practice across national parks can be shared uh, in terms of how they can best uh, cater for increasing number of visitors during peak uh, seasons and also how they can promote sustainable tourism. In response to some of these pressures, the Loch Lomond and Trossachs Park um, has introduced new seasonal bylaws and created camping management zones over the last couple of years to deal with uh, the excess number of visitors. And without using these extra powers, uh, the National Park and the Ranger Service would not have been able to properly manage heavily used sensitive locations and protect the communities they serve. This is an area I think the Scottish Government can play an important role in by reviewing existing powers available to national parks and the penalties available, for example, for littering and fly tipping and other forms of unacceptable behaviour we have unfortunately seen over the past couple of years. Changes are also needed to give uh, local police, uh, local authorities and the ranger service additional powers that can help deal more effectively with that unacceptable behaviour. Presiding officer, let me conclude by welcoming the creation of at least one new national park. I also welcome the opportunity it presents to look at how we resource and empower existing parks as well as new parks, helping them deliver net zero targets. I also urge the Scottish Government to address the currently inadequate powers available to national parks. Uh, this would benefit every rural location in Scotland, whether a national park or not. I uh, support the amendment in Brian, Brian Whittle's name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lockhart. And I call uh, Martin Whitfield to be followed by Christine Graham for around six minutes. Mr Whitfield. Uh, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it is a privilege to contribute to this debate about national parks and indeed the importance of national parks, both here within Scotland but wider around the world. And it's a pleasure to follow Dean Lockhart's contribution. And it is right that our national parks should share best practice and learn from the experiences of each other and indeed reach out to national parks around the world to learn from their experiences. Beatrice Wishart commented about forest bathing in Japan, the ability to enter, in the case of Japan, a forest zone, but a wild area, and then just pause. And to enjoy that moment when nature reaches out to, quite frankly, very stressed individuals, particularly after our recent history with COVID and the challenges that face our communities. And indeed, in that moment of silence where someone is in the wilderness, perhaps we see one of the ways that we can help those as we go forward with the economic challenges, the health challenges that are facing us. And it was very right for Paul McLennan to talk about John Muir, the importance of the father of our national parks, born in Dunbar, who at 11 years old moved to the US, who very much self-taught and as a primary school teacher, I'm not sure how many lessons I began with the great quote, I might have become a millionaire, but actually I chose to become a tramp. A man who found pleasure tramping around the natural lands of the US. A man who took himself to science fairs with inventions, found his way into industry, and then suffered an industrial accident where for one month he lost his sight. And in that time, he chose to look not back into the place that he lived or the industry he'd got his money from, but to nature. And in that nature, to find a cure and to find a way to express the importance of the interaction between human beings and that which rests around him. And in 1872, after four years of campaigning, Yellowstone National Park was established in Wyoming under the Act of March the 1st. Congress at that time said this will be a public park or pleasure ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. And that brings me to my one slight criticism of the government's motion today, that in it, it doesn't expressly, expressly set out the importance of our national parks for the mental wealth, health and well-being of our people. Because it is right it can fight biodiversity and the challenge. It is right that it can fight climate crisis. But it is also a place where the people of Scotland can find mental well-being, peace and quiet, and a way to face what comes their way. John Muir, the father of national parks, before email, before Zoom calls, 
before the internet, achieved Yellowstone National Park in the US in four years. And it has been over 20 years since we've had a national park established here. And Scottish Labour is rightly proud and champions of the protection of Scotland's national environment. And we sit in this chamber today, as been mentioned, with only one person who has created a national park, and that is my colleague Sarah Boyack. What does that say about the ambition of the government between then and now? Despite the Scottish campaign for national parks identifying the seven new potential sites as far back as 2013, ten years later, there has been no action from this SNP government to bring forward concrete plans to create new parks and indeed the Green Party manifesto, there was talk of two national parks, and now we're at one. And I would say to the Minister that I do have a concern that we could end up in a never-ending consultation going forward before we actually see the creation of one. And I deeply hope two or more national parks here in Scotland. And I would ask for the Minister's confirmation that steps will be to will be taken to prevent that because as Emma Harper rightly said there is a natural conflict there is a friction in national parks between particularly regarding planning and new housing but also renewable applications and it brings the community that live there against um, some of the economic uh, entities that exist within our national parks Moon, please do. But I thank the member for giving way does he acknowledge though that New national parks need careful consideration, that we need to be working with communities. And the example that I gave where a Labour minister didn't consult with a community resulted in a very embarrassing situation that had to be re-amended by a member's bill. Martin, I'm, I'm very grateful for Mark Ruskell's intervention. And he is right, and that's the shame of 20 years of non-discussion having taken place, non-review of the Act, because there is a way through this, and it is about genuine consultation with the communities and people um, that exist within our national parks and those that seek to use our national parks, the visitors. And what is a shame, um, and I really say it, what is a shame is that we've had such a waste of time when actually coming into COVID, had we had three or four national parks that worked, what a resource that would have been to Scotland going through this, this period. I do very much briefly want to champion, um, quite frankly, because, you know, th there's had slight silence here, the campaign for the Scottish Borders National Park, um, because so much work has been done in respect of that, dating back to 2017, where their feasibility study um, was undertaken, and the work that they've done, and the identification, particularly with regard to tourism, that sadly tourists tend not to stop in the borders, but use it as a journey to pass through, which is such a shame. And indeed, should they stop, as they have done in increasing numbers, it hasn't put the conflict on local resources that it perhaps has in other places. Time has beaten me. I had much more to say, but I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, for your patience. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Mr Whitfield, I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Christine Graham, for a, a fairly generous six minutes. Oh, that's lovely. I'm pleased to speak in this debate, though with a tinge of irony, but before I press on, can I say to Mr Whitfield, there'll be plenty to say about the, Scot plenty to say about the Scottish borders. Now, why a tinge of irony? Some from a couple of sessions back may recall my failed members' bill to extend the Pentlands Regional Park to cover the southern part of the Pentlands. The Scottish Government, Labour and the Conservatives and the Liberals opposed this, though I am pleased to acknowledge the Greens gave me support. And there was also resistance and opposition, which I understand from the farming community and from local authorities. I will return to that. Regional parks are just an administrative animal and far less intrusive than national parks, with the planning and other legal protections it may bestow. So I am pleased to see this change of political heart across the chamber, uh, and I know uh, some from the previous challenges ahead. Now, I know this is a bit of a bidding war between the various speakers, and I am right up for a bidding war. I am confident that the Scottish borders and Midlothian will be successful not least because of the groundwork by Mr Whitfield campaign for a Scottish Borders National Park, which has already commissioned and received an independent feasibility study reference value, which confirms it satisfies all the criteria. And I want to thank Malcolm Dixon for his briefing to me on this. In passing, I have sympathy for my old hunting ground, Galloway, 
and frankly see no reason for there not to be two national parks in the south of Scotland, and I am sure these would be ably supported by South of Scotland Enterprise. But my priority, of course, is my own patch. Not for selfish reasons, heaven forfend, but for the following reasons. And this is the sales pitch. The advantage of Borders and Midlothian is plain to see. Close and under pressure from a growing city population and surrounding towns, pressure to expand building further into our green heritage increases, accelerated by COVID, which has led many to seek literally greener fields. It's a valuable asset in terms of its landscape, history and culture, but it is an asset which needs protection as well as the economic advantages of national park status. It ticks all of the boxes of the aims of the National Park in terms of National Park Scotland Act 2020. For example, to conserve and enhance the natural and cultural heritage of the area. We have the Roman site at Trimontium, where 15,000 Romans were posted, and now the recently modernised museum, Abbotsford at Melrose, Sir Walter Scott's pad. The yes, certainly. Finley Carsten. Thank you for taking the intervention. Would the member uh, join, join me in calling on the, the Chief Exec and the Chairman of the South Scotland Enterprise Agency to back both bids for national parks in the Scottish Borders and Galloway National Park? Christine Graham, and I can give you the I'm, I'm going to shock you. I'm going to agree with you. The, <laughs> I'm going to agree with the member. My apologies, Deputy Presiding Officer. The great tapestry at Galashiels and, of course, the wonderful building there, hometown of Coulter's Candyman, Ali Bally B song, which was devised by Robert Coulter, a mischievous, uh, mischievous worker in, in Gala, who got into lots of trouble. It's a wonderful story. The common ridings that go right across the borders in Midlothian, coal mining heritage, Newton Grange and Gorebridge, paper making in Pennycook, all that from the past, and the bonny high street of Peebles, harking back to our high streets of York with lots of small independent shops. Then again, to promote and sustainable use of the natural resources, think of all the cycling and walking routes throughout the borders and extending hill walking, the Southern Upland Way, and at Tweedsmoor, the source of the Great River Tweed, the Pentland Hills under extreme pressure. The whole area is alive with a vast diversity of animal and plant life. We even have resident golden eagles in a secret place. I could write a book on the assets of the area and may very well do so when it becomes the national park. Now there's my optimism rooted in evidence. Then there's accessibility to major populations. This is important. Through rail, road and bus links, being just a few miles south of Edinburgh makes a democratic choice for a national park. And bordering with the north of England, bringing tourists and, I hope, accelerating the extension of the Borders Railway. There will be challenges and concerns, as I referenced earlier with my regional parks bill, especially with the farming community. And my goodness, I do understand their concerns. They are the frontline custodians of the landscape, but it's a working landscape, so they must be at the forefront of any consultation. But they too, I hope, will see they can benefit from the protections and also the economic opportunities to, to diversify. Finally, there you have it. Biodiversity, blissful landscapes, accessibility. But I listened carefully to what my colleague Fergus Ewing had to say about the practicalities of a national park and the residents there who deserve to be happy where they live. And so it's important that we learn from the current national parks and don't repeat mistakes. But again, I say, cast your vote for the borders in Midlothian, and if you've got a second choice, pop in Galloway. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Graham. We now move to closing speeches. I call firstly uh, Sarah Boyack for around six minutes, Ms. Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been a really good debate this afternoon. I think we can all agree with that. Lots of competition, a huge amount of pride for people's areas, and a, a real sense that we have more to be done. It's unfinished business in terms of new national parks for Scotland. And this debate has been a very long time coming. And I, although I welcome the support from the first, from the, uh, first speaker today, um, Lorna Slater, about another national park, I am very keen to get a bit more detail. 
I would like to know that it is not the national park, that we will have a strategy with national parks, plural, going forward. This was the first debate we had in our new parliament, and I was then proud at that time to announce our priorities and reassure MSPs that we would make swift progress on establishing our first two national parks. And listening to colleagues today has reminded me that actually there were a lot of different views at the time in terms of the nature of what those parks would look, look like. But we got on with it. And in particular, Loch Lomond and the Trossachs and the Cairngorm National Parks, they were, such, they were long overdue in Scotland. And I, like to, I want to join others uh, for thanking the APRS and the Scottish Council for National Parks for all the work they did before then, but also since then, for over a decade now, to try and get SNP, successive SNP governments to make progress. I have been genuinely shocked that we have not seen any new national parks. So that is why I particularly welcome today's debate, because this has got to be the start. Because as colleagues have said around the Chamber, the benefits of national parks are clear. To celebrate and enhance our world scenery, to ensure effective management and protection, and to enable planning ahead. And as so many have said, they are good for tourism. They attract visitors to spend money, and in doing so, boost our local economies. And as both Colin Smith and Emma Harper said, are particularly important in creating new opportunities for our young people. And as others have said, they support rural development and they act as exemplars for land management and the sustainable use of resources. They are also part of our national identity and they can demonstrate that stewardship of our national environment is, natural, natural environment is something to be proud of. But as a couple of colleagues also said, Beatrice Wisher and... Sorry? Y yes, of course, it's brief. Very good hearing. Yes, I, I will recall uh, Sarah Boyack's stewardship of the legislation through Parliament, which uh, I commend her for. She will remember during stage two, uh, 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 as I attended the committee, that Mike Rumbles, a former colleague, put forward uh, a compromise which resulted in there being five directly elected board members of the National Park, out of a total of, I think, 19 in Cairngorm. Um, that was a compromise, I think, which Mr Rumbles uh, negotiated with Ms Boyack. Does she feel it is time to review whether the balance is right and whether there is a need for more democracy in our national parks in Scotland? Sarah Boyack, I can give you the time back. I will tell you what it does remind me is that when you are an arrangement or a coalition or whatever you would like to call it, there is always going to be a tension between the two parties <laughs> if, if both parties are doing their job. That is what I would say to Fergus Ewing. Um, and I have, I have memories that go back. We are not going there today. Because I really, want to look I really want to look forward, because there was a point made both by Beatrice Wisher and Brian Whittle about the importance of people's health and well-being. As we come out of the pandemic, national parks are potentially part of the solution, as, as all of our natural green spaces are. I do want to welcome Jackie Bailey's contribution today, as she has been a stalwart campaigner, not just for establishing the Loch Lomans and Trossachs National Park, but for the investment to make it a success. And when I look back at our first debate, those issues were absolutely on, on the table for that discussion that it was not just enough to declare national parks, you had to continue to support them. And I think that message has come across the chamber today. Colin Smith was right to point out that the economic benefits, one pound spent in a national park leads to 10 to 17 pounds in the local economy of a national park. That is hugely important. And we are all missing out because we have still only got two national parks. When the APRS and Scottish Council for National Parks produced the report, Unfinished Business, they identified seven potential national parks, and this was nearly a decade ago. Um, it was well summarised in the Scots magazine in their Great Park debate. Uh, ben Nevis, majestic mountains. Glen Affric, secluded and sylvan, Scotland's finest glen. Cheviots and the border hills, timeless landscape rich in history. Galloway, lush and wild, Scotland's pastoral gem. Wester Ross, majesty in stone, wild Scotland epitomised. Coastal and marine park, the dramatic magical coast, Harris, a world apart, dazzling beaches and amazing landscapes. We are spoilt for choice in Scotland. There are other national parks in addition to the first two. And we have clearly got local communities organising and running campaigns in the Cheviots and the Borders and in Galloway. So given that we have got this debate today, the key issue is what is next? And I would like to hear from the Minister in her summing up speech the number of national parks, the strategy going forward, 
not just to manage people's expectations, but to lift our aspirations. Because I think we all expected, expected that 20 years on, we would have seen more national parks. And as Martin Whitfield highlighted, our amendment says that we regret the lack of progress. We need more ambitious plans. And we also need to make sure that we don't forget our national scenic areas and regional parks, because they're also critical in tackling our climate, nature and biodiversity emergencies. So there's much more work that needs to be done. So for those who've been relentlessly campaigning and persuasively campaigning over the past decade in particular, we need to add momentum to their work today. And I hope that the Minister will give us um, more clarity in her summing up speech. Um, and in her opening speech, Lorna Slater herself made the case for more national parks, plural. She didn't restrict herself to one national park. So let's get a strategy underpinned by political commitment, not just to celebrate our beautiful landscapes, but to make them more easy to explore. In some ways, I've got an easy job because I'm not asking for a particular national park in a particular area. I want more national parks so that my constituents can explore Scotland, can go on holiday in Scotland, can add to our local, uh, local uh, environment, can add to our local economies, and so that their children can learn from our beautiful country. There have been excellent cases made across the chamber today. Colin Smith restricted himself to two national parks. Um, if, if Rhoda Grant had been here, she would have gone for at least three in her constituency. And you go around the chamber, People are proud of the areas they represent. And as we build up, recovery from COVID, tackle the cost of living crisis and tackling our nature, climate and biodiversity crisis, now is the time for action. Now is the time for a strategy. Now is the time for more national parks. So let's get on with it. Thank, Thank you, President. Thank you very officer. much, Ms Boyack. I now call on Finlay Carson for around seven minutes, Mr Carson. Deputy President Officer, it's an honour to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. As many of you will be no doubt aware, it is a subject very close to my heart, having brought this matter up on a numerous occasions in committee, as Mark Ruskell will recall, as well in this chamber, and I have hosted campaigners in Parliament over uh, the years. Indeed, of my six pledges when I first stood for election in 2016, the creation of a Galloway National Park was one of them. I am delighted that uh, lobbying specifically for a Galloway National Park uh, uh, resulted in it being included in the Scottish Conservative Manifesto at the last election. I have just started. If you let me make some progress, thank you. Um, clearly, the creation of new national parks in Scotland is supported by cross-party MSPs, but I join Colin Smith and Beatrice Wishart, who have raised their concerns about the baffling situation when we only have two national parks, particularly in light of the climate and biodiversity crisis. This debate should serve as a hurry-up for this government to do what it should have done years ago and accelerate the process to trigger the legislation to designate new national parks in Scotland, the birthplace of the father of national parks, John of the Mountains, uh, John Muir, as mentioned by Paul of Dunbar MacLennan. Um, John Muir activism helped to preserve the world-famous Yosemite Valley, visited by myself, Paul uh, MacLennan and Fergus Ewing. Uh, not all at the same time, I should add. But his example has served as an inspiration for the preservation of many uh, other wilderness areas. And it's a shame that his example didn't inspire the SNP government to take action before now. Donald Cameron mentioned that in 2016, former Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham said the creation of national parks requires considerable planning and it carries cost implications. And in 2019, Derek Mackay implied that national parks would stymie economic opportunity, sterilising a whole part of the south of Scotland. Now, these statements are quite bizarre, given that while the Scottish Government invests around £13 million in its two current national parks, it results in a return on investment of between £10 and £17 pounds for every pound spent. And that's not even to speak of the significant environmental benefits. Twenty years ago, the two existing national parks were created, and it is fair to say that mistakes have been made along the way, as mentioned by Fergus Ewan and Mark Ruskell, particularly with regards to the ambitions of the host communities, and we must learn from this. And Dean Lockhart touched on the controversy of the original consultations all those years ago and how it must be improved. In the words of the Scottish Government, national parks serve as a model uh, for sustainable development, and with that are central to rural economic development and recreation, sustainability and conservation efforts. Now, that statement can only be re uh, become reality if each national park has carefully crafted aims and objectives and policies to ensure it addresses the unique characteristics of each different location. Emma Harper mentioned the importance of the right model, and, and, and it's, we absolutely need the right model in the right place. 
The Cairngorms model appears to focus primarily on environmental protection. The Loch Lomond and Trussex model could be argued to have a focus on managing visitor numbers and management enforcement to address some of the issues uh, raised by Jackie Bailey. Sir Alec Ferguson often referred to the creation of a national park light, uh, ensuring the remit and outcomes of legislation match the desires and wishes of local communities. Performing in Galloway is a real springboard to address the special needs of Galloway's unique mix of extensively land use shaped land and natural landscapes. I will take an intervention. Christine Graham. It's very gracious of you, uh, Mr Carson. As I'm going to write with you and others to Professor Russell Griggs of South of Scotland Enterprise, could you just put on the record that your second choice, I understand your first choice, would be the Borders and Midlothian if you had a B plan? Too many U's in that intervention, uh, Finlay Carson. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, the member uh, can put on record, uh, or the, the official port can put on record, that the uh, borders application would be my second preference. Um, <laughs> without without uh, question, this is an exciting and unique opportunity to introduce greater flexibility in the overall design of national parks. And I hope that calls by Fergus Ewan and others can bring about ongoing adaptation and flexibility of the legislation and policies to match communities' expectations now and in the future. Galloway has been a national park in waiting since 1945, when the Ramsey Report described it as being eminently suitable for such status. Nothing has, in fact, changed since then. And I believe it is formidable, the formidable backing, thanks to the Galloway National Park Association, who have garnered public support and tremendous enthusiasm across a variety, variety of stakeholders. We have got all the, the, the three councils, uh, local MSPs, to support the proposal, over 100 meetings online showing 80 per cent in favour, over 1,000 members, business champions and young supporters, and over 400 young people have signed a peer-led petition in support. All that said, I still believe that it is critical that after the initial consultation, a full and broad economic impact assessment and feasibility study is carried out, including any positive or negative impacts on our existing businesses, particularly our agricultural businesses, whose priority remains to feed the nation. There are good reasons for championing Galloway National Park, not least that it already meets all the National Park tests. As we heard from Colin Smith, it has the potential to boost the economy in the southwest corner of Scotland that has struggled to find employment opportunities for its young people. And Fergus Ewan mentioned the lack of housing, but much of this is down to failures of other policies which should not be seen as a barrier to the, uh, bring in a national park uh, and the benefits it can, it can bring. And while Donald Cameron rightly highlighted the notable national park credentials of his region, creating a national park in Galloway ticks all the right boxes, especially as the area already has a number of designations namely three national scenic areas, the UK's largest national reserve in Wigton Bay, the Galloway and Southern uh, Ayrshire Biosphere, and Europe's first dark spa, uh, sky park. Uh, none of them cut it like the national park designation would. Uh, Galloway has a, strong, uh, a long standing problem with its economy and retaining its population. National park designation, with both a conservation and sustainable de development objective, could really bring transformational change for the area. Galloway absolutely has a coherent identity and is an outstanding quality in terms of both natural and cultural heritage. But national park status must not create a museum or playground for visitors. It must be forward-looking. For many, national park will be where they live and work. The social and economic needs of all communities, both in settlements and dispersed across the countryside, must remain of paramount importance. Presiding officer, along with the Galloway National Park Association, I would like to thank the campaign for Na Scottish Campaign for National Parks for their work over the years. The late uh, and my must, much missed uh, predecessor, Sir Alec Ferguson, uh, the former presiding officer of Holyrood, was also the president of SCNP. Like me, Alec uh, campaigned tirelessly on behalf of Galloway, and in his words, Scotland has two national parks, it's time they had some children. It would be wonderful for us to finish the business and be part of delivering new national parks on his behalf. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Carson. I now call on Mary McCallan uh, to wind up the debate for around nine minutes, uh, Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, and firstly, thank you very much to all the members who have participated in today's debate. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, no pun intended, when considering our existing national parks and their contribution to addressing the great existential challenges of our time, namely the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. 
Um, we've also considered what they mean to communities living in and around them and how visiting them is managed. We've discussed in depth how stakeholders and the public are to be involved in shaping the criteria which my colleague Lorna Slater will use to identify the next area for national park status. And um, before moving to consider some of uh, members' reflections from today, I should like to stress again how central our natural environment is to those dual challenges of avoiding climatic and ecological breakdown that I mentioned uh, previously. Scotland has what are still regarded as some of the, if not the most ambitious emission reduction targets in the world. And prior to coming to the chamber today, my colleague uh, Michael Matheson was able to confirm to Parliament that Scotland has met its 2020 target in this regard. And while these are reflective of a period of unique national and international difficulty, which no one would want to celebrate or see repeated for that matter, it does show progress. And as my colleague Lorna Slater has mentioned, we will complement those emissions reduction targets this term with targets for na nature restoration. And that includes a commitment to protect 30 per cent of our land and seas by 2030. I've said a number of times in the Chamber, Presiding Officer, that we are so fortunate in Scotland. One of the reasons that we can be this ambitious on these great challenges is because of the ample opportunity in our natural environment to sequester carbon and to support biodiversity and indeed to support inclusive and sustainable economic development and, as Brian Whittle and Martin Whitfield rightly pointed out, to support and improve public health. Um, on environment in my area, be it woodland creation, um, of which we are currently attending to 80 per cent of all activity in the UK, peatland restoration, where through a quarter of a billion pound investment, we will see 250,000 hectares restored by 2030, be it through clean energy generation or blue carbon management or good soil management and others. The centrality of our natural world to the great challenges of our day cannot be underplayed. This, of course, poses a real opportunity for Scotland to be first movers, to lead the way. And in doing that, we must ensure that our people and our communities are poised to benefit. And as the Minister with responsibility for um, nature-based solutions and for land reform. This balance is something that I am keenly interested in, and I'd like to uh, be clear to all members who've rightly raised the importance of community interests in this process today, and that has come from members right across the chamber. I'd like to assure them that this is something that is uh, very important to me, and I'm keeping a keen uh, watch on. And on that note, I should like to confirm to Mark Ruskell, per his um, discussion on the land reform bill, that I will launch a consultation on a new and ambitious land reform bill over this summer. Um, community ownership and progressive land use will be central to this. And to bring us back to today's topic, it's clear that um, national parks existing and to come can play a really important role here. Both our existing national parks... Yes, happy to. Finley Carson. I appreciate the Minister taking my intervention. Can, can you confirm that uh, you believe that the, the current legislation, national park legislation, is fit for purpose and that some of the issues that have been raised today around consultation and membership of uh, boards and whatever will be addressed or will there need to be amendments in the future? Minister. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to confirm that I think the legislation is fit for purpose and also that I think, as um, Laura Slater made very clear, in her opening remarks and in the progress she's made so far in developing the policy, consultation is absolutely key. So we'll be watching very closely what comes out of that, both as regards to design of parks and to governance measures uh, that the members mentioned. Um, both our existing national parks are demonstrating how, by building strong partnerships, natural areas can be restored at different scales, from the, the vast Great Trossachs Forest uh, to smaller community-led initiatives such as the, the Capra Cayley project, which has been mentioned. The parks are also keenly involved in action to address climate change through woodland expansion and peatland restoration. Um, and indeed, of these practices taking place in our natural parks can and should be an example of land use uh, in the rest of Scotland, because we know that climate and nature emergencies demand that land stewardship and its use is generally put on a sustainable footing. And national parks are currently uh, doing a great deal in this regard, but I think they, they, they could undoubtedly do more to be test beds to develop best practice for sustainable land management and nature restoration at scale. 
And just before moving on um, to some of the other substantive issues raised this afternoon, presiding officer, I should like to take a moment to thank members for taking their opportunity uh, to raise in the chamber the reasons why their constituencies and regions would be the best place and great candidates for the new national park. Um, they will have to temper their enthusiasm for just a little while longer as uh, we work with stakeholders over the summer to establish the evaluation framework. And as we've heard, this framework will be key to ensuring that open and transparent nomination process, which everyone is right to express, expect. Sorry. Now, there was much support expressed for Galloway, I think by Brian Whittle, Colin Smith, Emma Harper, Finlay Carson and others. And in fact, before being elected, um, when I was still working as a lawyer, I attended a discussion in the beautiful Gigi's Yard and Gatehouse of Fleet, which I know my other South of Scotland uh, members will be familiar with, where I heard campaign groups and indeed those who had been involved in the establishment of the other parks take part in a very robust discussion. And in fact, the debate in that debate, the tensions that I heard that night were articulated really well by my colleague Emma Harper. And it's clear to me that she has a very uh, strong understanding of the differing views in Galloway, particularly on the, the issue of um, progressive land use. Kenny Gibson described in detail the beauty of the Clydemuir Shield and its success as, as a regional park. Um, Paul McLennan spoke of the Lammermuirs and the potential of borders was detailed by uh, Martin Whitfield and Christine Graham with great vigour. Um, I'd also like to thank the members who spoke of their experience of living in and around national parks. Fergus Ewing spoke of his experience in the Cairngorms and Jackie Bailey of hers in Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. And I know that some of the issues that Jackie Bailey raised, including with jet skis, are matters which she will continue to uh, discuss with my colleague Lorna Slater. Presiding officer, in the remaining time, I'd just like to address some of the other key issues raised during today's debate, starting with an issue very close to my heart, which is access. Many members this afternoon have reflected on the role that our national parks play in encouraging and facilitating responsible access to the countryside to the benefit of their mental and physical health. Uh, we should be very clear that Scotland's access rights are to be celebrated. It is great that they are among the most robust and progressive in the world. And indeed, it... Yes, happy to. Very grateful for the Minister for giving way. Would she uh, agree with me that having just two national parks within Scotland precludes many people from accessing those parks, which is one of the main reason why we need to expand the number in Scotland? Minister. I think the opportunity for more people to benefit from uh, being in a national park is one of the reasons why the government is now pursuing it, and I agree with the member. Um, but my point was that it's no wonder that people wish to spend time in our stunning natural environment and our access rights are rightly uh, robust and uh, progressive. We all have rights over our land, but of course with rights come responsibilities. And the Scottish Government has been at the forefront of seeking to support our parks with visitor management. In 2018, we launched the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, four rounds of which have now supported 66 projects across 15 local authorities. And in 2020, during the height of pandemic pressures, uh, my colleague Fergus Ewing, in his role as the then Econ uh, Rural Economy Secretary, established a visitor management group which led to a visitor management strategy, which is now backed by, uh, recently backed by £3.9 million, which is principally being used to recruit over 200 ranger uh, posts. Uh, this afternoon, the question of funding have, has, of course, arisen. There is no doubt that we are in a challenging fiscal circumstance. Our resource spending review demonstrated that very clearly. But I sense consensus throughout the Chamber that resourcing the creation of a new natural, national park is a sound investment, the benefits of which for economy, uh, environment and society present very good value for money. I'm afraid I am just in my last 20 seconds, but I, I'm glad to pick up with you afterwards, Sarah Boyack. Um, Presiding officer, to conclude, um, I'd just like to round off the debate by again thanking you and for everyone for their active participation in this discussion. Uh, the Minister for Biodiversity and myself, we very much value all of the points which have been put forward and we look forward to working with all members across the chamber to deliver the right new national park for Scotland and that to sit alongside the existing ones that we have. Together they will continue 
to be at the very forefront of Scotland's response to the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. Thank you. Thank you.